Okay, so thank you so much for coming to the uh, last <clears throat> executive forum of uh, the Year of the Ox, but definitely one of the biggest ones. We're going to end it with a bang with Microsoft. So before we uh, start, just a few announcements for people who are regular with our executive forums. I'm sure you have all seen these two QR codes before. The one on the left is a QR code for the live updates of photos that will be taken by a photographer during the forum. And on the right, it is our Sieb's official English uh, WeChat account. And obviously, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Ho, uh, Ho Yang wants to come to uh, on campus, but due to the uh, pandemic, uh, there's nothing much we can do. But we are aiming for him to come next year, a bit more of a face-to-face -face meeting with everyone. And um, before we uh, continue, uh, let me just go ahead and move things on real quickly to uh, our main topic of today, our chat between Dr. Ho Yang and Professor Shamin. So uh, to give his keynote speech, please welcome our Professor of International Business and Strategy, Associate Dean and MBA Director, and obviously author of the new book, Gorillas Can Dance, our very own Professor Shamin Prashantham. Lawrence, thank you very much. And it's wonderful uh, to have people here in the room and people online. Uh, and I'm especially grateful uh, to Dr. Ho Yang for being part of this uh, gathering and this, uh, the interaction that we are about to have on this topic of how large companies partner with startups. Uh, this is the topic of a book that I have recently published. And the lead story in this is Microsoft. In fact, one of the most interesting moments for me was shortly after the first accelerator in Beijing was opened by Microsoft, I went along to visit. This was roughly eight years after I had started to talk to Microsoft and you know, eight years before I completed writing the book. So kind of at the midpoint of this journey I've had, uh, following how Microsoft have been engaging with startups. And I walk into this room with about eight or 10 tables with startup teams sitting at them. And I get the shock of my life because on these tables are Apple Macintosh machines. So I look, turn to my host, a guy called David Lin back then, who was director of the Beijing Accelerator and say, hey, David, what's going on? And he said, oh, you know what? We really want our startup partners to succeed and we will take them no matter what they are doing. And so that was a very interesting sort of pivotal moment when I was recognizing how it was becoming more and more imperative for large companies to be able to step out of their own sort of narrow perspectives and take a much broader view of how they collaborate, how they innovate. Uh, and so what I'm gonna do first of all is to very quickly give you the, a, a, a sort of a whistle stop to a through what I have been observing and what I've tried to put together in this book. And then we'll transition into a conversation um, with uh, Dr. Ho Yang, who is the CEO of the Greater China Region for Microsoft. So he'll be joining us online. So in the book, I start with this story of Microsoft, which I've been observing for over a decade and a half. And one of the most important starting points is this guy called Dana Lewin, who was part of the Macintosh team in Apple, the only non-techie that Steve Jobs took with him when he left Apple to create Next and eventually became a corporate vice president at Microsoft, helping Microsoft engage with startups in Silicon Valley back in a, a sort of at the turn of the century. And slowly over time, they were able to put in place systematic programs to be able to do this. And then a few years later, along came a guy in Israel called Zach Weisfeld, who created an accelerator program there because he felt we could as Microsoft do even more with startups. And this was a format that got quickly replicated in Beijing. That's where I had gone and had that experience as well as Bangalore. Uh, and then in emerging markets, um, these uh, efforts kept growing. And so uh, this is a picture of a guy who runs the China 
um, aspect of uh, startup engagement with this big sign that says Microsoft loves startups. And you even, oh, and ah, this clicker is in the mood to move quickly. This is another tremendous moment that I had, which was with Doug McMillan, the CEO of Walmart, who came to China a couple of years ago and was being shown the startups that Walmart was beginning to work with in China. And they were all Microsoft Accelerator alumni. And so you could see that over time, Microsoft was really um, trying to work with startups. And this is the proof of the pudding, the CEO with a little plaque on his table that says Microsoft uh, loves startups. And so as I've been observing Microsoft and indeed other corporations engaging with startups, uh, what I've understood is that Well, even gorillas can learn to dance. And there are three aspects that I noticed in Microsoft's work, which is that there was, first of all, a strong rationale for this. There was a why, which was related to how the strategy evolved, but there was a strong emphasis on figuring out the how. How do you engage with startups? And also a uh, geographic ex um, aspect to this. And so this, in fact, has been how I have structured the book, and that's what I'm going to uh, dive into now, these three aspects of the why, the how, and the where. And when I speak to um, Dr. Ho, uh, we will also go through each of these aspects. Um, so I have a couple of chapters on each of these three aspects, so you're going to get a very, very quick overview of each, starting with the why. And the starting point is that entrepreneurship matters to large corporations. Uh, there are a lot of uh, disruptive forces that big companies have been facing. They're trying to figure out how to be more entrepreneurial. One way to do this is to engage with entrepreneurship on the outside. Uh, and that's because there is a potential win-win in the sense that there are complementary capabilities that these companies have. For example, the big corporation has scale, the smaller startups have agility. There is, however, a problem, which is these, uh, and I call this uh, the asymmetry, uh, the paradox of asymmetry. Uh, and it means uh, the very differences that make these corporations attractive to each other also makes it difficult to work together. Uh, the scale and the agility represent attractive differences in a sense, but when you start working together, it is challenging. And so what I have observed is that companies like Microsoft and others that have taken startup partnering seriously have essentially been able to address various aspects of asymmetry. And I think understanding that is important. And there are three that I particularly have identified. One is the asymmetry of goals. These different sets of organizations look for different things and more importantly, at different timescales. A second difference is around structure. Very structured, siloed, large organizations, very flat, simple, structured startups and becomes challenging to find role counterparts. And thirdly, uh, what I call an asymmetry of attention, which is the big company managers see an ocean of startups and don't know who to prioritize their attention to. The startups, on the other hand, struggle to get the attention of the people that matter, the decision makers in the large corporations, which then takes us, therefore, oh boy, which takes us to the how. Uh, and the how uh, I, uh, I uh, look at in two ways. Um, one is, about how to partner systematically, which really is if we unpack these asymmetries and how do you address them, but also to say that it's more than a one-shot affair. You also, as a big company, need to think about learning, learning how to do this uh, in, a, in a way that's repeatable. So many of you, I see some who have, will have heard this many times before in class. Um, for others of you, this may be the first time, but very simply, uh, there's th there are three steps I have noticed across different companies, including Microsoft, in terms of what they're doing is essentially, first of all, 
clarifying what the synergy is, because that helps to overcome the goal asymmetry. Uh, and broadly speaking, I identify two types of symmetries, building block symmetries, which companies like uh, the synergies, which companies like Microsoft have been emphasizing. We have base underlying technologies, startups can build on top of it, we can co-sell, as opposed to a company like BMW, which says, well, we have certain pain points around issues like cybersecurity. We want startups who can come and sell to us, but it's, a, it's very different from an arm's length vendor relationship. It's a much more strategic uh, partnership. And so uh, this building block and pain point synergies, I think are useful to clarify. It seems blindingly obvious to say, you need to, to be clear about what the win-win is, but uh, you'll also be surprised how fuzzy that can be and which can be a cause of grief. Uh, and then secondly, there is the interface, which is about creating a port of call that a company, can, that a startup can go to. Who do I speak to if I want to contact um, a big company? Microsoft have created different interfaces over time. Now their broad umbrella is called Microsoft for Startups. BMW have BMW Startup Garage. Unilever have Unilever Foundry. Uh, Walmart had created something called Omega 8. These have people with KPIs to actually talk to startups and that helps to address the structure asymmetry. And then finally, you have the cultivation of exemplars, success stories, and doing this intentionally because when success is observed, then startups have, have a better idea of how to attract the attention of big companies. Big companies have a better idea of who to prioritize their attention to. And to just give you a couple of examples I, that I've already mentioned, um, I think Microsoft was sort of really the pioneer in terms of leveraging the building block synergy using what I call cohorts uh, as a form of structure, uh, as, uh, as a form of interface, as opposed to the way SAP did this, which is to use what I would call a funnel. BMW, on the other hand, uh, very much like SAP forming this funnel approach and Infinity, the Nissan luxury car, more like Microsoft having a cohort. Cohorts very often are corporate accelerators. And when I say cohort, I mean it's like an MBA class. Getting in is difficult, but once you get in, uh, you know, you're all together, a big part of the, it's a time-bound program, very structured, often with the syllabus, and peer interaction is a big part of it. The funnel is like the job search process after the MBA. Many people start it and much few, many fewer complete it. You may not even know who else is involved. And that's more like the innovation challenge type approach. Both of these interfaces have their benefits. The um, funnel is better for predictability. And I think it's not surprising that I've seen a lot of German companies adopt this uh, approach. Uh, but the a cohort is good for serendipity. Unanticipated benefits may happen. Alliances that were never three-way alliances may get created between two startups that didn't know each other with the large company. And so the point is that working with startups uh, for a big company actually requires thoughtfulness in terms of being able to overcome these asymmetries. Uh, that being said, if a partnering capability is to be developed, then that needs to also uh, be worked on, and this takes time. It needs to be, first of all, initiated. And here I find that it takes a few entrepreneurial individuals to make it happen, usually. I've often heard the comment, we didn't ask for permission, we asked for forgiveness, you know, and people getting started. But for this to then expand to be replicable, uh, this, it becomes important to galvanize support from and get buy-in from leaders and from peers. Uh, and so, for example, at Infinity, uh, the Nissan luxury brand, the person running this was working hard to get the support of the business leaders. So the CEO of Infinity started talking about their startup partnering program in their newsletters. Uh, and this was then made it easier to get support from the business unit leaders who ultimately had to give opportunities 
for the startups to work on. And eventually, systematizing this involves consolidating these initiatives and making them very coherent with the overall strategy. And this is where I think Microsoft has particularly excelled. Over time, uh, the, the way in which the cloud computing uh, strategy has evolved, it just became so sensible to be engaging with startups because startups would use a lot of their cloud infrastructure and services. And so it became a very clear win-win. And in fact, what I understand is that even sales incentives were aligned in a way that Microsoft salespeople were incentivized to co-sell the best solutions created by their startup partners. And this is a way in which you can then align startup partnering with core strategy. It doesn't simply be uh, remain as an add-on. And over time, what I've observed in Microsoft, there are many, many versions of what they've been doing. Um, and it's, I think, been a very interesting nonlinear learning process, but something they were committed to and therefore have built capability as they started with initiatives like BizSpark and then something called BizSpark One, which very few people remember now. Uh, and then they tried to bring this under an umbrella in 2013 called Microsoft Ventures. There was a guy called Rahul Sood who was um, uh, driving this. And then later they changed the brand. Then they had the Microsoft Accelerator brand. And more recently under Microsoft for Startups, one of their latest offerings is what they call the Founders Hub. And this has been happening, first of all, in the West, but then with a lot of uh, input from Israel, uh, additional uh, involvement of other countries in emerging markets, China, India, latterly Africa, uh, and in so doing, co-evolving with the ecosystems. And that takes me to my third and final point, which is the where. And here I make two points. One is that especially for large multinationals, there is a great opportunity to partner with startups around the world. But there's also scope to harness these for good. Uh, and on the first point, I think the important thing to recognize that different locations need different approaches. So you can have both emerging markets and advanced markets, and you have, can have locations that are sort of high reputation and ones that are not so well known for innovation. And yet in all of these, I have been fortunate to observe partnering. Uh, for example, in Silicon Valley or in London, I, I've seen Microsoft working very seamlessly with startups, but also in places like Bangalore and Jongwon Sun. Uh, and, and the main difference, of course, is adapting and adjusting to the, uh, the characteristics of emerging markets. Emerging markets, on the one hand, have huge appetite. There's a lot happening. There's a lot of energy but they're also less mature as ecosystems. You're much more likely to find first-time founders in China and India. You go to Silicon Valley or Israel, you find people on their third startup, their fourth startup. Um, and so making these adaptations and adjustments is, is important. But even outside of these hotspots, useful partnerships can happen, particularly when policymakers are uh, entrepreneurial themselves. So for example, in Glasgow in Scotland, uh, Scottish Enterprise had an initiative that very transparently brought together large multinationals working in the region with local startups. Yet in a place like Ningbo as well, I have seen very interesting partnerships, but in a more subtle way where very clever policymakers have used existing policy measures like the Smart City Initiative to make this happen. And they did this in a very sort of clever way. They took the entire smart city pie and broke it into a small number of big pieces. And then they gave each piece to one company. And so the deal size was big enough that they were interested. IBM got the first piece around smart logistics. It's Ningbo is a very big port city, as you know. Uh, the other part of the cunning plan was they also knew that no one company could deliver the entire project. They would need to work with local companies to execute. And who are these local companies? Small entrepreneurial startups. And so you had even IBM working with local startups in Ningbo um, and doing very interesting things. The other thing, as I indicated, was these sort of partnerships can be a force for good. 
the sustainable development goals are very important for the world to achieve. COVID has made it even more important to achieve and even more difficult. Uh, the 17th of these 17 goals is called Partnerships for Goals. And it occurs to me that these non-traditional allies coming together with their complementary capabilities can play a big role. This is something I particularly observed in Africa, where we have a small campus and where I've also been doing uh, research, but I think in many parts of the world. Uh, uh, Microsoft uh, last year launched a global program for social entrepreneurship, which underlines this. And just to mention a few examples, SDG3 around uh, health. There have been so many examples during COVID. Cloud Physician is a startup in Bangalore that, was, that worked with Cisco uh, and provided very important remote support for intensive care units, especially in smaller hospitals. And when there was a horrible second wave in India earlier this year, that startup had a very important role to play. Cusini is a startup from Johannesburg that makes water filters using frugal innovation. And they have partnered with DHL to make these water filters available in 50 locations where DHL have depots, often making it possible for clean water to be accessible in hard to reach places. That's SDG six, clean water and sanitation. Budweiser, uh, in China, have been working with a startup called Mitero, turning beer waste into uh, re recyclable uh, or eco-friendly plastic. Uh, and that, of course, is one of our big challenges around climate change. And so as I conclude these, um, this sort of overview of the book, where I try to finish is looking ahead at this decade, which is designated by the United Nations as the decade of action, where we are supposed to be accelerating uh, efforts. And I think not only is it important for these companies to work together, I think it's important for all of us to be thinking about three mindsets that I think we see uh, in what I've been describing. And these are an entrepreneurial mindset, which represents the why that I was talking about. Companies need to be entrepreneurial, but that's a mindset that all of us can actually be thinking about. In terms of the how, which is how do you engage with startups, fundamentally, this is about a collaborative mindset. We can do more when we work together. And the final piece about the where is the importance of a global mindset. At this point in time, globalization does not have a good rep. Entrepreneurship does. Uh, globalization, not so much. And yet, I do think we are actually so interdependent and that's what COVID has shown. Uh, and despite all the rhetoric, you still see so much business happening between different uh, countries, uh, including between the West and China. And I think the ultimate, what, what's important is this global mindset. Uh, and I believe that that uh, is key for what uh, we're talking about. And so uh, drawing all of this together, I wanna conclude by saying, uh, that it has been an absolute pleasure to be studying all of these companies and Microsoft in particular has somehow been very cooperative. So uh, with that, thank you very much for your attention and we will now switch to a discussion with Dr. Uh, uh, with Dr. Yang, uh, 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 Ho Yang in a moment. Hello, hello, hi, good evening. Hi, 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 hi. So, uh, Yang, thank you so much uh, for joining us from Beijing. Uh, I have a slightly um, awkward situation. So, I, when I look at you, I will look uh, at the camera, and yeah, then yeah. when you're oh, speaking, no I'll look like look here. But I'm actually looking at you on the screen. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, no worries at all. Hey, <laughs> thanks so much for. Uh, inviting me to the session. I'm uh, super excited to be here. And uh, I uh, apologize for uh, not being able to uh, join uh, in person uh, for, for reasons that we all know too well. I'm sure uh, part of the audience uh, are suffering from the travel restrictions uh, as we speak. But uh, again, super excited to be here and uh, looking forward to the session. Super, super. So as you uh, just heard, um, you know, I've been very lucky to be following Microsoft for a long period of time. And actually one of the funny things that's happened very often over the years is I would meet people in Microsoft in different countries, and then I would end up telling them things that they didn't know. 
uh, you know, like how Dana Lewin had started things in Silicon Valley or, or yeah. things like this. Now you're a relatively, uh, you're a relative newcomer at Microsoft, I gather. Uh, you joined uh, maybe earlier this year and this year, you're uh, correct. as uh, the uh, Greater China Region CEO. So maybe we can start by hearing a little bit of your story and how you came to be part of Microsoft and what excites you about Microsoft at this point in time. Yep, absolutely. Uh, I, I would love to uh, share that experience, right? So, so first of all, growing up, I mean, you just can't get away from uh, Microsoft, <laughs> right? Uh, of course, when we were growing up, we were all using uh, uh, Windows and Office, right? And and uh, I still remember uh, when I was in uh, college, right? We had to uh, venture out of the campus and buy uh, fake Windows for five RMB <laughs> at the time, <laughs> right? So, so everybody grew up with that experience uh, here here in China, right? Um, and uh, of course, uh, being a, a physicist and engineer myself uh, by education, right? Uh, of course, I had to learn to, uh, to do coding. And of course, uh, during those years, if you learn to do coding, you start obviously with all the Microsoft tools, right? I, I, st I I started with uh, uh, VC++, right? That, that's, that's how I got into engineering, right? So, so I think from that experience uh, with all the Microsoft developer tools, uh, basically that equipped an entire generation, right, of engineers uh, to, to really learn and develop, right? Uh, and then of course, right, growing up, um, kind of be, being a technology geek, if you will, right? I, I, I idolized uh, Bill Gates, <laughs> right? Uh, so, so uh, uh, and then of course, after he retired, right, I mean, he did some uh, fantastic work at the Bill Gates Foundation, which I also followed closely over the years, right? So, so, so basically kind of uh, growing up, uh, very familiar with, uh, with Microsoft. Uh, but but uh, to be to be very honest, right? Uh, all that didn't even uh, give me enough motivation to uh, explore opportunities with Microsoft over the years, right? Uh, I, I think I think uh, actually um, uh, I, people like me became more and more intrigued with Microsoft. I would say over the last seven to eight years. Right. Uh, of, of course. Right. I mean, obviously, you know, if you follow the stock market, right, you, you'd be amazed by how Microsoft was performing as a company. Uh, and then, of course, that's just uh, what we observe, right, from a results perspective. Right. But if you really dig deeper, you can actually get to see that amazing transformation. Right. So obviously you mentioned that uh, when you first uh, got involved with the accelerator program, right, you, you look at all the uh, audience there using uh, using uh, using uh, uh, Apple products. Right. And, and, and to me, that, that, that's also part of what's amazing uh, with, with Microsoft. Right. You, you, you obviously see uh, uh, several years ago, right, the launching of Office on iOS. Uh, right, even even as we speak right now uh, on the latest Windows 11, right, we are going to support uh, Android App Store, right, on Windows 11, right. So you see that transformation uh, and really that change of mentality, which was amazing, right, amazing for such a gigantic company, right, to, to go through. Um, and then you 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 really kind of uh, try to read about uh, uh, the culture and, and, and learn about uh, the mission for the company and how the culture is uh, transforming, uh, and that to me is even more uh, uh, um, uh, appealing, right? Uh, and, and of course, obviously here at Microsoft right now, uh, the mission is really to uh, empower every organization and every person in the world with our digital technology. Uh, but but with that, it's really just a uh, learning mentality and, and culture, right? Uh, right, how, 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 and I think that's, that's really the most difficult thing to do, right? How you, how you get such a big company with, you know, 200,000, right, 300,000 employees to change gears and, and shift their mentality, right? And, and really adopt a learning mindset, right? That, that's been uh, just amazing. And, and so reading and learning about all those things, I was like, hey, you know, that, that looks really appealing to me, right? I want to be part of that. I want to learn. Um, and, and then I think, you know, uh, uh, the, the, another piece that was, that, that was appealing to me was uh, how Microsoft is just so committed to China over, over a long period of time, right? Uh, and and even, even today, as we, as we speak, right, Microsoft is still increasing investments in China, right? Um, and, and really continuing to build our research and engineering centers here in China, right? And, and uh, continuing to grow our headcounts in China, right? So, so that level of uh, commitment, right, has been amazing as well. 
Uh, so, so I know it's a long answer <laughs> to a starter question, right? But, but I think all those things, right, from kind of the experience of uh, using Microsoft tools growing up, right, which kind of shaped my earlier kind of uh, engineering uh, education, right, to then learning about the transformation that Microsoft has been going through, right, all, all those things were just super exciting. Uh, and for sure, right, since, since I joined the company, uh, I think everything I've experienced uh, is exactly as kind of what I've learned, right? Just really tremendous learning culture um, and, uh, and uh, a very open mentality, right? To working with uh, partners, competitors, and of course, uh, startups. That, that's the topic that we're discussing today. Fantastic, thank you. That's a super overview. And the emphasis that you are placing on this learning mindset and the transformation gives me a nice segue into, so the first of these three things that we wanna talk about, the why. Mm -hmm. And so clearly, even Microsoft felt the need to become somehow more entrepreneurial, to become yeah. more dynamic. Nice. Uh, and you must also be seeing this in uh, the various companies that you work with. So Walmart uh, was yeah. one of the examples I gave, which is a strategic partner of Microsoft and clearly engaging with startups was part of their own digital transformation yeah. and their feeling that they had to be more entrepreneurial. So what are your observations uh, about why companies need to be more entrepreneurial. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll just start with a uh, with a uh, pr probably obvious point, uh, but but uh, but that, that's that's not lost on, on big companies like Microsoft, right? So so evidently, right? Every every big company uh, today started as a startup at some point, right? Uh, for sure, for Microsoft, it was uh, forty some years ago. You know, for many companies, you know, the Googles and Amazons of the world, it was twenty some years ago. And then there are many many successful in large companies, right, that, that started as a startup, you know, five, six, 10 years ago, right? Uh, and then on the, on the flip side, if, if you look at, uh, at the list of uh, successful companies in the world, especially in the tech sector, right? The, the, the names are changing all the time, right? Uh, you, you have uh, uh, many up and comers, right? Cracking into the scene. And then of course you have uh, many large companies that just fade away over time. Right, uh, and, and and so so what what and and then that that transition actually happens. I would say just every five years, right? You look at the top uh, tech companies. You look at the list of the top ten. It's actually a, a different list, right? Every few years, right? So so now if you look at it from that lens, and, and if you think about, hey, how do I not only build a successful company, right? But how do I build longevity, right? How do I sustain that uh, that success over over a long period of time? Right, that's where you really need to think about, okay, I need to maintain that entrepreneurial spirit at the company, right? And I really need to work uh, with these startups, right? Uh, and, and, and I think probably there are a few angles, right? Uh, I, I think the first angle really is uh, uh, right, that constant inflow of fresh ideas, right? Getting to learn about latest technology. Right, getting to learn about uh, the different uh, trends that's happening, right, and, and then really also just learning about uh, uh, what are some of the better ways to serve our customers, right, and and uh, uh, learning about what are the latest uh, pain points with our customers and how do we co-create new business models and new products to address their pain points, right. Uh, I, I think just even from that fresh inflow of ideas, uh, right, I, I think it's super valuable in itself. Right, uh, and then th there's another piece that's uh, very much cultural, right? Uh, for sure, every large company, uh, right, especially successful companies, you know, you would have uh, quite a few business blocks, right, that are cash cows, right, that are very successful, and you want to sustain that as much as you can. Uh, and together with it, I think for sure, a lot of times you, you just lose that hunger, right? Uh, you, you just lose that aggressiveness. Uh, and uh, I, I think one of the things that, that I find to be super helpful is when I sit together with founders from startups, I can see that hunger in their eyes, right? And, and I get, I, I just, I just get excited, right? And, 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 and that also gives me a venue and a way to reflect on myself and say, hey, you know, how, how do I adopt that same mentality, right? Remain that level of, uh, of, uh, of uh, aggressiveness. Uh, and cascade it down to the to the to the across the organization, right? 
Uh, and then I think another uh, cultural piece is uh, uh, that, that agility, right? How do you make quick decisions, right? Uh, keeping that pace of innovation. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, you, you look at many of those startups and you say, wow, that their leadership team and the entire company is so cohesive, right? They're bound by, by, by a common mission. Uh, they're bound by a, by a common goal. And the entire company is working towards that one purpose, right? And they're just fighting, right? And I think that spirit and the cohesiveness, right, is something that every large company will really need, right? So, so I think all these cultural elements, right, you, you, you just really get to uh, experience when you sit together with the uh, entrepreneurs from startups. Uh, and then you, you just you just uh, you, you just feel energized again, right? You you literally re-energize the entire organization. Uh, but then you know again, like you said, right? I, I think uh, partnering with the startups is for sure <laughs> not an easy thing, right? Even though we have so many good reasons, it's actually it's actually very difficult. And I would say I, I've observed and experienced a couple uh, challenges, right? I think the first one really is right. We share the right startups to, to work with, right? Uh, for sure, you know, in China, if you look at uh, uh, startups that, that are backed with reasonable, you know, resources and capital, you probably have a north of uh, 50,000, 70,000 startups, right? So, and as a big company, right, so, so such as uh, Microsoft or some of the others that you've mentioned, right, you, you cannot work with all 50,000 of them, right? I mean, that's just impossible, right? So how, how do you pick the right ones to work with? Uh, and, and then for sure, right, how, how, do you, how do we actually work with them well so that, uh, th number one, they don't get frustrated, right? Because end of the day, we all recognize that they operate at a different pace from the, you know, the Microsofts, the Walmarts, and, and frankly, even the, the, the Google and, and, and the Facebooks of the world, right? So how do we not frustrate them, right? Make sure that we operate under the same pace. Uh, and, and then at the same time, right? And how do we, uh, as a company, right, have that, uh, humble mentality and learning mentality, right? And really create something that's beneficial for both parties and beneficial for the customers as well, right? Um, so, so, so I think, you know, that, 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 that's just kind of my uh, quick answer, right? If you will, to, to the answer to the question of uh, why, right? Why, why do we see value? Why it's important? Uh, and and I, will, I, I will proudly point out that uh, I think if you, if you look at uh, just from a results perspective, right? Uh, I think it, it clearly have added lots of value to Microsoft, right? And, and actually, if you look at the list of, uh, you know, probably say the top five uh, technology companies by market cap, right? Uh, Microsoft has consistently been on that list. Right. Well, other companies have, uh, you know, kind of bubbled up and then kind of faded away. Right. Microsoft has remained fresh, right, and then remained on the list. So, so we have definitely seen the value uh, as reflected in the in the results that we have. That's uh, that's just great. And uh, you know, you were talking about the importance of picking the right startups. Uh, and one of the interesting things I've observed in Microsoft is also how the thinking evolved and got refined. You know, in the earlier days, yeah. uh, they would basically have a wide range of startups that they would work with. And so in that uh, 2012 Beijing uh, accelerator in the very first yeah. cohort, there was this startup called Testin, which was just six months old and had worked out that, you know, there was going to be a big opportunity for mobile app testing uh, and they've gone on to do very well, uh, but it was a very, very young startup. Uh, fast forward to 2017, when Shanghai's accelerator was opened, and China's the only country where Microsoft have uh, mm -hmm. two accelerators, it was a very different set of criteria. It, would, it was only startups with at least Series A round funding, uh, meaning much more mature startups. Testin would never have got into the Shanghai accelerator. And the thinking had evolved, partly because Microsoft was forming a clearer view of which startups they could add the most value to. Yeah. Uh, and they figured that there had to be a slightly more mature group. Also, by this time, it was very clear it had to be enterprise startups, startups with sort of a B2B focus rather than 2C. And so essentially, this is also about figuring out the how. 
yeah. uh, which Microsoft really, I think, worked very hard on. And also different people got involved in, in different points in time. That's also been an interesting part of the story. What are your thoughts uh, on the how and what are some of the things you're observing now having in the you know few months since you've taken over and things that you're sort of thinking about trying to refine and get better at yep yep it's so so uh, no that's a fantastic question uh and, and you're spot on in your observations that uh, right just how microsoft uh works with startups and who we work with you know that has evolved quite a bit over the years right and i would say right now we actually focus on a, a couple dimensions, right? So, so the number one dimension, I think, it, it comes back to the fundamentals, right? Uh, right, which 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 companies can we better enable, right? Which companies uh, will have a much higher likelihood of being successful, right? If they're equipped with the Microsoft technology. Right, uh, and of course, you know that that that, that not only includes uh, you know cloud infrastructure and business applications, right? But 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 really, kind of the synergy that we can create together, right? Uh, so so that's more on the uh, enablement uh, piece, right? And then the second piece that we that we take a hard look at is how do we how do we really grow together, right? So so when we when we when we say hey we have a partnership, right? It's not a loose partnership, right? We we actually want to invest. Uh, in this company's future, uh, by saying, "Hey, let's let's really draw a blueprint on how we can grow our business together, right?" Uh, and and that also includes a few elements, right? So for sure, we would love to uh, to provide the startups to with access, right, to to Microsoft's enterprise customer base, right? Uh, and that, that's really on a global level, right? Um, and and we, we for sure feel that, you know, obviously that's a tremendous value to the startups that we work with. Uh, and I think the second thing is really, you know, back to products and technology, right? How do we have a really kind of a product level integration uh, that will better serve our customers, right? Do, do we have that blueprint? Do we have that uh, roadmap, right? Uh, and then again, right, the goal is really to create uh, uh, better products and better solutions, right, for our customers, right. Uh, so, so if we can really draw a blueprint with a, with a startup, then then that's for sure something that we want to work together on, um, right. And then I think the the third dimension is really how how we can learn together, right. Because the end of the day is is a learning journey for for both sides. Right. So, so we for sure, you know, create workshops and, and, and for lack of a better word, you know, mentorships uh, to these startups. Uh, and, and at the same time, we create many of these uh, sharing and learning sessions where we ask the entrepreneurs uh, to come to us and share their experiences with our product teams, with our employees. Uh, right. And, and, uh, and share their views on uh, technology trends and business models. Right. So, so it's a, it's a mutual uh, learning journey. Right. Uh, and I think that the fourth dimension is actually very, very interesting. It's actually the talent flow, right, from Microsoft to these companies and then the vice versa, right? Uh, I, I, I saw an interesting uh, statistics, right, uh, which, which was uh, super, actually, I'm super proud of it, right? Uh, so so let's, let's take AI startups, for example, right, in, in China. Right, uh, and obviously that's been a that's been a hot area over the many years, and then for sure in, in China, right, uh, uh, we not we have not only developed great uh, AI technology, right, but also really developed great use cases, right, for this technology to to be applicable to real to real world, right, and, and help companies uh, grow and, and and actually help uh, users have better experiences. Uh, so so if you look at uh, the AI startups in China, uh, especially the ones that have uh, grown into uh, unicorns or or, or or have been or have IPO, right, I, I, the number was over seventy percent of these startups have one of their founding members. Uh, and one of their CEOs or CTOs uh, who work, who used to work at Microsoft, right? And to me, right, I, I, we, we don't view it as, hey, we lost talent, right? We, we, we lost talent to the market. Uh, the way we look at it is, is hey, th this is fantastic, right? This is, this is just awesome for us. That means our strategy is working, right? There are so many Microsoft alums uh, that, that, that really kind of uh, flowed into the broader ecosystem, right? Participated in the flourishing of, uh, of the different tech sectors in, in China. Uh, and, 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 and in return, right? They, they also helped Microsoft build a much broader ecosystem for our own solutions, 
right? So, so, so that that angle has been uh, something that that I'm for sure, like personally, super proud of, and we 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 want to continue, right? We want to continue that talent uh, flow and and back and forth, right, with these startups. Um, and, and, and I think, uh, you know, probably the last element of the how uh, is, is really just for leaders, right, uh, to, to be engaged uh, in for sure on, on both sides, right, for sure on the on the Microsoft side, right, this is something that I'm uh, just personally enthusiastic about, and I personally spend a, a good amount of time, right, engaging with the startups. Uh, and, and, and for sure, trying to make sure that, uh, uh, I mean, you, you, you know, we, 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 we develop that blueprint, uh, right, with some of these companies uh, and have uh, 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 customer level and product level integrations and synergy, right? So, so, uh, uh, so yeah, so, so that's kind of my, uh, my quick answer to the, to the how. And again, I'm just super enthusiastic about uh, some of these things that we're doing today. Uh, that's uh, just great. So now moving on to the where, and uh, I think it's extremely uh, fantastic that we're speaking to the Greater China Region CEO because this is an American company. Uh, and one of the things that has been absolutely fascinating for me is observing how Microsoft engaged with startups in different parts of the world. Starting with Silicon Valley with Dana Lewin. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, Microsoft was viewed as an outsider in Silicon Valley. Yep. In fact, uh, if you will forgive me, uh, Yang, I'll, I'll say a story about what I observed in, back in 2010. Yep. Okay, this was the first major event that Microsoft put on for startups in Silicon, their Mountain View campus and was called the Bispark One Summit. They took like just under 100 of the most innovative startups that had joined the BizSpark program, which was their first major program to engage with startups and said, we will work with them quite closely. Uh, and actually the vast majority in, back then were Western European uh, or North American startups. There were many Asian founders, yeah. but not many Asian startups per se. Anyway, during the lunch break, you know, I was talking to some of the founders and after a while, I think one of these guys felt very comfortable with me uh, and said, you know, can I actually tell you what I really think? So I said, please tell me what you really think. He said, you know, that morning session, it was like watching your dad dance. <laughs> you know, and so for these Silicon Valley entrepreneurs back in 2010, Microsoft was an outsider. It wasn't like one of the cool kids on the block. No. But... You know, what I perceived was actually here is Microsoft, I would associate with a word which up until that point I would not have, which was humility. No. You know, they were putting themselves out there and in a way making themselves vulnerable, reaching out to these founders that they definitely were not sort of a very familiar kind of entity uh, of, even though they were from, from the West Coast. And building on that, and especially with the involvement of the Israelis, uh, and then as more and more other markets like China and India particularly got on board, very quickly it morphed into this very global kind of uh, approach. And then after that, I even uh, found some very interesting examples in South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, and so on. And so that has been just absolutely incredible. Uh, this global spread. And so I, I'm really interested in your thoughts uh, from a China perspective, which, uh, you know, uh, very quickly has become a very important ecosystem in general, and I think also for Microsoft. Uh, so, you know, your thoughts about how China can particularly be leveraged. And also, the fascinating thing that's possible is that startups working with Microsoft in one part of the world can end up engaging with Microsoft and its clients in other parts of the world. That startup called Testin that I mentioned from the first batch in Beijing, when they set up an office in San Francisco, uh, they reached out to Microsoft in the US and said, hey, look, we're an alum of your Beijing accelerator. And very quickly, Microsoft in the US extended support and helped them mm -hmm. um, you know, at a couple of events and things like this. And so very curious to hear your thoughts on uh, how, how startups in China are being supported, not only in China, but globally as well. Yeah, yeah. 
But uh, that that's actually a great, great observation. And by the way, thanks for sharing that story, right? Uh, it's uh, it's uh, already difficult to test your popularity by throwing parties and see who show up. Right? And then it's another to actually throw a good party, right? And actually have a reasonable dance, right? Uh, but, but, uh, but, uh, uh, for, for sure, right? Uh, I, I think uh, uh, over the years, right? Microsoft uh, just did a fantastic, uh, uh, made a fantastic decision, right? In expanding the accelerator program and startup program here in China, right? And, and my understanding is that to begin with, it was actually a, a very simple philosophy, right? Uh, the company uh, mission is to empower every organization and, and uh, every every person, right? And by, by that philosophy, right, you, you just need to work with uh, the companies in China and startups in China, right? So it actually started with a very simple uh, philosophy, right? Uh, but but then very quickly we realized that uh, uh, that is actually a gold mine, right? Here here in China, right? Uh, the amount of uh, innovation that the startups in China is uh, driving, right, is tremendous. Uh, and, and I think really for for a few reasons, right? Uh, I, I think the, the one one reason is uh, uh, if you if you just look at uh, the scale of uh, the economy here in uh, uh, China, right, and uh, all the different healthy industries uh, that, that that are thriving in China, and right? it just provides such a hotbed for innovation, right, uh, for competition, right, and 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 uh, for the pace of innovation in these various. Uh, uh, industries, right, to happen at a faster pace than the rest of the world, right, uh, and 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 then I think at the same time, right, if you just look at the number of uh, unicorns, right, China has generated is actually very much on par uh, with uh, with the U.S., right, and, and much higher than the rest of the world. Right, so 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 from there, right, just the pace of innovation uh, that you get to observe uh, and 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 work with and enable, right, has, has just been very fruitful, uh, right. And, and then what you mentioned is absolutely true, right. I, I think part of our value to the startup community is the global reach, right, and and the global support, right. Uh, and, and I will say. In today's environment, right? In today's global environment, it's probably more, more, more true than than ever, right? Uh, we we absolutely help uh, uh, startups in China to to become more international, right? As they expand to other regions, right? Whether it's um, you know South Asia or or broadly APAC or or Europe or or the US, right? We 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 help them uh, not only with. Uh, Technology and and uh, you know infrastructure, uh, but we we also just help them with uh, uh, compliance, security, right? How they navigate the local talent market, even right? On all, all these issues, uh, and then the, the vice versa, right? Uh, all the global startups from the U.S., from Israel, right? As they uh, you know, test the, the the market here in China, which obviously is very attractive to them, right? We also help them uh, as well, right? So, so I think that 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 uh, uh, kind of role of interconnecting the regions on a global level, uh, again, especially in today's environment, right, is is one of the key values that we add to the program. Uh, right. And, and then I think, uh, you, you know, when we think about uh, the where, right, we for sure not only think about the regions, but, but really think about uh, the different uh, industries. Right. And, and, and uh, uh, we, we had obviously, you, you know, more or less focused on kind of the software industries, right, the IT industries, right, the cloud, the SaaS applications, right, etc. Uh, but, but for sure, more and more, right, we, we, we are, you know, uh, really excited and expanding into uh, just 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 uh, more diverse and vibrant industries here, right? For example, you know, if you talk about autonomous driving, or you talk about uh, semiconductor, right, uh, pharmaceutical and healthcare, right, and and, and uh, even manufacturing, right, here here in China. I mean, these are all sectors that we are really. Uh, uh, expanding into in terms of uh, our collaborations and, and presence, uh, right? And and uh, and for sure, you know, also uh, you know when we look at sustainability, right, etc. And all, all these places on a global level, right, are areas that we are super excited about, right? And we want to play our part, right, in helping these companies grow uh, and helping these companies interconnect, right, on a global level. Uh, fantastic. And you mentioned the word sustainability, yeah. which uh, leads me to sort of the final piece where 
It was very interesting to me that at the end of February 2020, um, Jean-Philippe uh, Courtois, the um, executive vice president, uh, announced this global social entrepreneurship partnering program that Microsoft was launching. So Microsoft had been partnering with startups for many, many years. Then in February 2020, they say, here's a special program uh, tailored for social enterprises. And uh, initially, there, there were these three uh, startups in Africa. And the timing is very key because by the end of February 2020, um, COVID was a big problem in China. It wasn't quite yet a problem in the world, right? I mean, people were just beginning to figure it out. I think it was about the 12th of March yeah. that WHO declared it was a pandemic. And I just thought the timing was so symbolic mm -hmm. of this decade of the 2020s, meaning that um, social impact was always going to be important. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, in September 2019, the United Nations said uh, the 2020s is the decade of action. And then COVID happened. Yeah. And so now you have this decade that we're all in. Yeah. Um, and for the MBA students in the room who are going to graduate next year or the year after, this is a decade that, you know, you in particular have a particularly important role to play. Um, you know, we have this challenge of this decade of action becoming even more important, even more challenging. And uh, a couple of things I think that are interesting from a Microsoft perspective. One is that I think over time, what I was seeing, even before that formal program was launched, you could hear more and more of an emphasis on we need to make sure that there's technology for good, uh, that kind of thing. But also, there's this big larger than life figure who will always be associated with Bill Gates that even uh, Yang, you mentioned at the start, which is Bill Gates. Oh. And so the work of the Gates Foundation and so on, which has anyway been active, but with COVID, you had this extra boost in terms of their work on vaccines. And more recently, when COP26 happened in Glasgow, uh, you know, the Gates Foundation making announcements of more announcements of how they were going to be supporting climate change. Yeah. Here in China also, there have been many initiatives that are very aligned with the sustainable development goals. I don't hear Chinese business leaders invoke SDGs as explicitly as some of their Western counterparts. And this is something I encourage my MBA students to do very much, you know, I mean, uh, because the more explicitly we think about the SDGs, the more we can actually amplify our efforts and connect them with those of others working in similar areas. Uh, but here in China as well, you know, a lot of what is being emphasized, like carbon neutrality, very much aligned with climate change goals, uh, then the emphasis on lesser inequality, again, is very much related to the SDGs. So it seems as if whatever the differences we have around the world, and at the moment, there seem to be a lot of differences, we are also aligned in realizing that uh, human suffering needs to be alleviated. We have social problems to address. And so from both a China and global perspective, it does seem that we do have a, a desire to make things better. What are some of your thoughts, uh, Yang, in terms of how uh, both this idea that you have very different organizations with complementary capabilities can come together? And what's the role of technology companies like yours in this? Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's that's. Uh, by the way, I'm I'm super happy to have a chance to uh, uh, right to just have a discussion on, on the social impact topic. Uh, right. So 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 first of all, right, like you said, you know, this is the uh, like looks like the beginning of a very uh, interesting decade, right? Uh, you know, like we always say, right? Don't don't let uh, challenging times uh, go by without making the best of it. Right, uh, and, and I think uh, you know, as unfortunate as the pandemic is, right, the the, the good thing is, uh, right, it, it, it triggered a lot of uh, deep thoughts, right, on healthcare, right, on uh, the economy, right, on on uh, sustainability, right, and, and it really provoked, right, a lot of uh, deep thinking, right, uh, at some of the large uh, corporations, right, on the role it should play. Uh, in, in social impact, 
right? And and for sure, right? You, you know, Microsoft, uh, right? Being being uh, kind of uh, right, one of the leading global technology companies, right? We we for sure have long realized our role uh, that we have to play in in all this, right? And and for sure, you know, we are committed uh, as a company, and uh, right, and and, uh, uh, and we we are actually driving uh, many many initiatives, right? Uh, but 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 I think you know, taking a step back, right? I mean, there there when we look at some of the most burning uh, problems that, that we need to solve, right? As, as the global community and really as, uh, as, uh, as human race, right? Uh, you, you just wouldn't be able to solve them without technology, right? Uh, and, and for all of us uh, technology companies, right? We just have to take that uh, responsibility head on, right? I mean, there's just no other way, right? So for example, you know, we talk about sustainability, right? Uh, and of course, actually we are, we are super grateful uh, that, uh, you know, hey, that, that's, that's one of the key topics that the world realize, realizes that we, we all need to take that on together. And we are really just excited that uh, obviously China is taking a global leadership position, right, with the 3060 30, initiative. Uh, but, but in reality, right, uh, we wouldn't be able to achieve that Right, uh, we, we, without without technology, right? So, for example, we, we, let's let's talk about hey, let's we need to reduce carbon emission, right? Step by step, right? So, how, how do you do do all these things, right? So, the first thing is you need to measure it, right? You need to measure how much carbon you are <laughs> you are producing, right? And and, and uh, even today, right? One of the key problems that we're trying to solve with our partners is let's just have a standard and a system and a tool for every company. Right to measure how much carbon they're producing, right, uh, and then how do we work with the new energy companies on carbon capture, on carbon reduction, etc. Right, but but let's start with one thing at a time. Right? Let's start with measuring, right, what what you're what you're doing, right, and then even that simple mission to begin with, right, needs just a, a, a alliance of global technology companies, right, both in the in the in here in China and for sure in the U.S. to just work together. On defining the standard, defining the tools, and developing the tools, right? Uh, so, so, so we are just uh, uh, stoked, right, to be able to play a part in it. Uh, and as you can imagine, right, for, for for us to tackle that big problem, we need so many new technologies, right? So many startups to grow into new Microsofts, right? And, and, and the WarMas and Googles of the world for us to solve that problem. Right. So, so we realize that inherently, right, we, 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 we need so many new technologies to develop, right, so many startups to grow quickly, and we want to be, to be part of that journey, right? Uh, and then, right, just, just shifting away from sustainability for a little bit, right, we, we also realize that one of the key things that we need to solve for today is, is the gap in digital talent, Right. Uh, you know, we talk about technology. Right. We, we talk about uh, the entire uh, uh, economy and industry becoming more and more digitalized. Right. We, we, which is absolutely necessary, right? especially after the pandemic. Uh, but then at the same time, we all realize that, hey, where do we get all the digital talent? Right. Where do we get enough enough engineers right, to, to, to help the world develop digital solutions, to help these great companies transform in a digital way? Right. And, and, and we as Microsoft, right, also realize that we have a big role and responsibility to play, right? How do we provide education, training to talent, right? So, so they take on that uh, digital capability and help kind of the, the, the non-traditional companies, uh, right, to, to really adopt a, a digital mindset, right? Uh, and then I think uh, even in addition to that, right, we also have a big role to play, uh, in being more inclusive, right, of the uh, disability, uh, disabled community, right? Uh, there, there, there is uh, actually over a billion people in the world that live with some form of uh, disability, right? How do we use technology to improve their well-being and quality of life, right? Uh, for, for example, you know, how do, I, how do we develop uh, better and easier to use AI uh, speech technologies, for example, right, for, for some of the uh, 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 population with disability. Uh, and then at the same time, right, can we, can we train them to be part of the digital talent that we were just uh, talking about, right, to, to become part of the, the digital community and, 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 and uh, the evolution of technology, right? So, so I, think, I think all these things, right, need technology companies to be part of, 
uh, to together drive, right? And, and as Microsoft, we're just super proud uh, that we are part of that community, part of that journey. And we would love for more and more startups, right, to be engaged uh, in that journey. And, and again, we are, we are, we would love, right, to partner with startups in that community on the social impact journey. Fantastic. So I think for now, let's uh, draw this part of this discussion to a close. And before we move over to Q and A, let's give uh, Dr. Ho Yang a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But Yang, but please don't go anywhere. So what we will do now <laughs> is open up for Q&A. And I warn you right now that we are going to end up disappointing a lot of people because we have to bring the show to an end by 8 o'clock and it will not be possible to accommodate everybody's questions. But we'll try and take a few. Uh, and if there's any online, uh, then whoever is, is following online just maybe uh, keep me posted uh, and we will try to take in a couple from there as well. But okay, so I see two hands. We will go with both the hands up at the back. One of them is called reserved and the other is called reserved as well. <laughs> reserved number one. Thank you very much. Uh, I was, thank you very much uh, for the, the, the talk and discussion. Very interesting. And I would just would like to come back if possible on, on a very interesting topic of pace and frustration. At some point, uh, you mentioned about uh, it's difficult, how difficult it is to manage the frustration of your startups. So I was curious about, could you please share a bit more uh, about this or give just a, maybe an example or to, to try to see how you really manage the frustration on both sides? Please, uh, Yang, any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, uh, I, I think I think uh, it comes back to a, a couple of things, right? So, so I think number one, uh, we we obviously need to make sure uh, we pick the startups carefully, right? We we don't we don't work with a thousand of them or two thousand of them, right? We 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 need to be careful, right, in picking the right companies and making sure there's the right synergy, right? That that's that's the foundation. Um, and then I think I think the second thing is uh, uh, is uh, we we for sure have a, a model where we have a dedicated teams right uh, to to work with them uh, and obviously these folks right will will for sure help drive the pace on the Microsoft side right I mean, they they take the lead they really drive everybody else here at Microsoft uh, and actually many of them come from the venture capital world or have been or, or have been entrepreneurs themselves. Right, uh, and and then I think I think the the third point uh, it, it will sound simple, but but that's absolutely true. Uh, which is it is a learning process for for Microsoft, right? Uh, we we just need to stay humble and learn. Uh, but but there there have been many moments right where we see frustrated faces. Uh, we, we just need to ask the question of, hey, what's frustrating you, right? How can we do better, right? How, how do we improve, right? And, and, and I think there's really no secret sauce, right? Other than just taking that mentality of, uh, hey, you know, we, 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 we are here to learn, we are here to grow. Uh, we know we are not perfect, right? We make mistakes. Um, we, we are frustrating as a company <laughs> sometimes, actually a lot of the times. Uh, right, but but uh, I think over time we we do get better, right? Uh, and, and and then at the same time, right, we absolutely take the lens of how do we add value for the startup, right? Uh, and 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 to be very 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 uh, open, right? I I think uh, you know when when you take the mentality of adding value and actually help them with some of the the things that that's that's just uh, critical to them. Right. Then the frustration level <laughs> has to be improved, right? So, so that's how we look at it and think about it. But again, right, by no means are we perfect. Uh, we are just all here to learn. Actually, that's a superb answer. I think both this point, even what I have observed across many companies is picking the right startup and figuring out over time who you can add value to. And then as you see these success stories, the startups also know which gorillas to dance with for what. Yeah. The other point about people is actually so true because the fundamental issue is that managers and entrepreneurs are wired differently. But one of the things I've observed is as companies have been, big companies have been acquiring startups, they have also been acquiring their entrepreneurs. 
Yeah. One of the guys in 2013 called Rahul Sood is a Canadian guy uh, who helped the first round of bringing the startup outing program in Microsoft under this umbrella called Ventures was brought into, he came into Microsoft through an acquisition of his startup and he was trying to figure out, so what role can I have in Microsoft? Maybe yeah. I can help them engage with startups. And, you know, obviously an entrepreneur has more empathy with startups, but also figuring out the, the way to manage the interface. So in Walmart, China, Walmart figured that the thing that's going to terrify these startups is they will think these, this big uh, Laowai company is a slow bumbling elephant. So what they said was, we will work with you on a 60 day pilot and you have to get it done in 60 days. And we will work with any given startup only on one pilot so that you don't get distracted. And that was very reassuring to the startups as well. And, you know, I think, uh, as uh, Yang rightly says, this is the learning process that helps things get better and better. Yvonne. Thanks. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Ho Yang and um, uh, Professor Shen Ming. It's great sharing. Uh, I actually have two questions. One is related to LinkedIn. So as a member, if, well, if I'm, I'm correct, uh, was acquired uh, in, back in 2016. Along the journey, um, I guess a lot of things are changing. And my question, first one is, um, uh, what's your, what would be your um, strategy for LinkedIn? Because uh, personally, uh, I, I just had uh, the experience yesterday when I clicked the updated. So um, I could not actually see the several, uh, the, the function of the post anymore. Uh, so I would like to see um, and understand more the strategy. And my second one is uh, related to um, Microsoft's cloud adoption um, and uh, wondering what's your um, um, thinking and uh, what would be the prospect for its uh, development in China market. Oh, okay. So two China specific questions, one about LinkedIn and one about uh, cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So, so, uh, so, so first of all, maybe just very quickly on, on LinkedIn, right? And, and I know that's actually not related to the, to the topic today, right? I, I think, you know, for sure, both Microsoft and LinkedIn had uh, uh, posted uh, announcements on kind of the evolution of uh, LinkedIn here in, uh, in uh, China, right? Uh, and again, right, LinkedIn is not exiting by any means, actually, uh, uh, right? We, we, we are, uh, I, I think uh, yesterday and today, right, launching kind of a new version of LinkedIn, which is very suitable for, uh, you know, job seekers and uh, kind of the talent market, uh, right? But, but uh, you know, further further to that, you know, obviously we will have to refer back to obviously the uh, announcements that, that were made, uh, I think a couple months ago, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think the bottom line is, uh, right, LinkedIn is uh, uh, committed to China and right? Microsoft as well. Uh, so, so to our question on uh, cloud adoption, right? I mean, that's actually a, 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 a very uh, th that's actually a, a very uh, uh, interesting question, right? So, so uh, the way we look at it is, uh, uh, China is actually uh, uh, one of the countries, right? That's super innovative, right? In how uh, different different industries and different companies uh, leverage digitalization and, of course, leverage the cloud. Right to enable their business to grow faster, right to build a more resilient supply chain, etc. Right, uh, and we absolutely are looking forward, right, to be continuing to be to being part of that journey, right, and that's very consistent with our strategy here in China, uh, which is. Hey, you know, we are we are, we don't think about it as hey, we are selling a product, we're selling cloud, right? We we don't think about it that way. The way we think about it is how do we help these companies uh, uh, embark on the journey of digitalization, right? Uh, how, how do we use our technology to help these companies manage their business better, grow better on the international scale? Help their management better, right? Help help them, uh, help them with their their the 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 ease to use with their infrastructure, etc. Right? That's how we think about it. Uh, and then together with that, of course, you know, what as they get on their digitalization journey, they will use our technology, they will use our tools, they will use our cloud, right? So so that's really how how we uh, think about it. Uh, but but uh, uh, but uh, to to me, right? That journey in China has been very 
vibrant in the last few years. Uh, but at the same time, I feel it's just getting started, right? Uh, no, really, I mean, this is a, it's a long journey for many, many sectors, uh, right? It's really just getting started, right? This is really the beginning of the road, right? I feel like we're in the in the in the middle of the first quarter of a basketball game. <laughs> right, right. I, that, that's very interesting. Okay. Uh, by the way, if there's any questions online, uh, please maybe uh, post. There is one. Okay. What? Go ahead and, uh, and read it. Okay. So there's a question from Charles Guo. <clears throat> In Microsoft China, how to balance globalization and localization? Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's that's actually that's actually a great question. And and the way we think about it is uh, is uh, is uh, uh, is uh, today uh, we look at it from two lens, right? The first lens is uh, today, you can rarely talk to a company uh, without talking about globalization, right? It, it's, it's just impossible, right? If, if you look at Microsoft's customer base, right, you have all the MNCs that are continuing to invest in, in, in China, right, looking to do better, uh, where, where they obviously need Microsoft's uh, uh, technology and support. And then at the same time, right, any Chinese company or a local company that we talk to, Right, we will we we'll want to talk about right. How do they uh, increase their scale on a global level? Right, how do they expand uh, internationally? Uh, right, so 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 in reality, uh, the 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 topic of globalization is is a, is a standard question, right? I mean, I I've never been to a customer where we don't talk about globalization, right? Uh, so so that's one lens. Uh, and then the other lens is localization, right? The way I look at localization is not to say, hey, how do I, how do I work with the Chinese customer here in China, right? I, I think that's too narrow of a lens, right? The way I look at localization is more, is more how, do we, how, do we, how do we drive innovation here in China, right? And, and, then, and, and then how do we grow and learn with all the different companies in China, right? With all the innovation and startups in China, right? And then apply them uh, on a global level, right? Both to companies from the other countries as well as to companies from China that are expanding globally, right? Uh, but but, but we, when we think about localization, we really think about how do we innovate locally, right? How do we take the local ideas, uh, right? And, and, but, but apply them on a global level, right? The, the, the true, the, 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 the original narrow sense of localization, I don't think that exists anymore. Uh, that's actually a very interesting answer. And I just want to add an example that I, in fact, talk about in the book. So one of the uh, startups that Walmart ended up working with um, was a startup from Shenzhen, which is a Microsoft uh, alum. And uh, they basically were helping Walmart to make the process of buying loose vegetables and fruits more smooth. So they used image recognition technology uh, to make that process smoother. And you could argue that in this way, Walmart was actually localizing its offering better, doing better in a very specific Chinese context. Um, and using this startup. But what was even more interesting was Walmart then recognized an opportunity to use this image recognition technology of the Shenzhen startup back in the US, but to solve a different pain point, which is in-store theft. Uh, and it seems to me in this way, this is a, you know, illustrates very well the philosophy that uh, Yang was talking about. It's about innovating in China and then figuring out ways to apply some of these innovations uh, elsewhere. Okay, uh, did I see a hand up? Okay, yes, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ho and Professor Shaming. I'm Kelly from MBA 2023. Uh, I actually know about Microsoft uh, Acceleration Program for a long time and really want to know how it really operates. Like we choose the startups into our acceleration program, then we enable them. Uh, do we invest in them or do we want to co-develop products with them? Or um, if they are like AI company, they build up on our computing, uh, like those uh, services, so they become our customers. So I really want to know how we really cooperate with them. Thank you. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, 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 I think I think there there are really a few angles, right? So, so of course uh, we definitely 
would love to, again, right, enable them with our technology. And, and I would say for most of startups, right, I mean, there is a, I would say pretty steep uh, uh, discount, for lack of a better word, right? Just just really to to help them in the in the initial phases, right? Uh, and then at the same time, you know, like you said, right? We we absolutely uh, share uh, uh, customers, right? Uh, for for example, I, I know we you know we we talk about some of the cases, right? But uh, you know, if there is a uh, 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 Microsoft customer, say Walmart, right? Uh, that can really use one of startups' technology, right? We would make introductions, right? We would uh, 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 help, right, to drive some of the product integration, right? So, so these are uh, some of the things that we absolutely would love to do. Uh, and then I think there is also a, a, another level, uh, which is just you know, kind of uh, uh, mentorship. Uh, right, kind of uh, giving them some advice and and and, and uh, suggestions on kind of uh, their technology journey, right? Uh, some of the some of the traps that they should avoid, uh, right? Some of the the sharing, and we also organize like camps uh, and other events where where they they you know some of the startups and, and the entrepreneurs can get together and really learn from each other. Uh, right, uh, and I think to your question on, on investments, uh, actually. Uh, for the most part, these are separate things, right? So, so Microsoft has uh, we, we Microsoft does have a venture arm, right? That that makes some invest investments, uh, but uh, we we don't necessarily invest in in startups in our accelerator program, uh, right? I I I think I think uh, uh, the the venture arm makes their own decisions that are separate, right? Here in the accelerator program, we really focus on how we help each other, how we drive synergy. In, in how we move technology forward, right? It's uh, separate from uh, the uh, investment decisions. Oh, uh, very consistent with what I, exactly what I've been observing as well. So, you know, there's a startup called Clobotics, for example. They have solutions that uh, are useful in a retail setting and for energy companies. So after working with Microsoft, they were able to refine their product, make it better, use Microsoft tools. Why does it matter for Microsoft? It's what I was calling the building block synergy. Because then, as this startup solution gets, keeps getting sold, the underlying technology of Microsoft is bundled with it, right? But also, Clobotic Solutions is very good. So Microsoft also helps to co-sell this. And one of their customers was Coca-Cola in China. And then Coca-Cola in Mexico started working with them. And then so on, you know. And... and um, you know, and one of the big attractions act actually for entrepreneurs to work for Microsoft with Microsoft Accelerator is they do not take an equity stake. And so many entrepreneurs have found this attractive because they don't have to be diluted. Uh, and it gives them from that point of view more autonomy. And if you think about it in China, what startups need, especially enterprise to be startups is not money. There's plenty of that for the high quality startups. They want marquee clients. And what Microsoft has been exceptional at is connecting startups with these uh, clients of theirs. Uh, okay, so we are rapidly running out of time, but I think we can squeeze in two, maybe. So you pick the best question from online uh, and we will take a question here, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Yoshi uh, from MBA 2023. And uh, I'm curious about uh, the why. Uh, you, you mentioned the big company lose hunger and aggressiveness. So you need that kind of uh, feeling from startups. Uh, but uh, I'm uh, wondering, uh, I, I'm curious that the, the mindset of the, the we, we need still hunger, we, we need aggressiveness. Uh, because uh, many large corporations, uh, I worked in a large corporation, manufacturing corporation, and people think, uh, don't, don't think uh, we need some uh, hunger or aggressiveness. It's already very settled down. Then how, what, what is the key uh, to keep, uh, to make people keep uh, that kind of mindset, entrepreneurship mindset? Uh, yeah, that's my question. Yeah, so so maybe uh, maybe I'll I'll just start first and uh, for sure, right, Professor? Please please uh, chime in. Uh, 
to to me to me by the way i i've i've seen many companies take that uh, mentality right uh, not hungry anymore right uh satisfied with with, with where they are and, and really having kind of a very dry pipeline of uh, innovation right to me i w- i would say it's actually not that difficult to have that t- mentality right because if we just count the number of companies that have faded away over time, right, over the last decade, even, right? Just how many prominent names there were household names. Every graduate wants to join, right? They were doing fantastic things, you know, top 10 by market cap, uh, and then just disappeared, right? How many companies, the, 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 that list is, is long, right? And if, if you just look at the list and you say, wow, right? How do I make sure I'm not on that list a few years down the road, right? How, how do I how do I make sure uh, I don't end up in that position, right? I think I think it just taking that angle, right, will make every leader lose sleep, right? Uh, and then proactively try to figure out, okay, what's my what's my growth engine, right? Kind of where's the next wave of innovation coming from, right? And 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 then how do I how do I have that uh, hungry mentality uh, and really learn how to kind of work better with the customers, right? Again, right, if you just look at the list of companies uh, f- fading away from kind of predominant positions, right? I mean, that 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 insecurity and hunger will come out, <laughs> at least from 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 what I see, right? So, so uh, Professor Shamin, please uh, chime in. Oh, I, I totally agree. And I think, of course, the level of external threat that companies perceive varies, right? But now we've come to a point where digitalization is now relevant to so many different companies. Like we went to a company that makes sewing machines. And you can see that that is now becoming digital with a, a screen and a, you, know, you can actually download an app which has some stitching designs and then it just automatically stitches. I mean, so now even sewing com- machine companies are what are trying to be more aggressive <laughs> and you know, so uh, I think eventually it catches up with, all in, with, with every industry in the end. Some maybe feel it sooner than others. Uh, but, um, and it's always better when you trigger the anxiety yourself rather than do it because you've been forced to by external competition. Okay, unfortunately, time flies when we're having fun. We have, maybe we'll squeeze in one more um, question from my good friend and star entrepreneur, Charles Bach who has this amazing digital health startup, which even uh, was presented to uh, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, when he was in Shanghai. So uh, please, Lawrence, maybe you can read out the question from Charles. Okay, so Charles asked, uh, Dr. Ho, you said e-health startups are important for Microsoft. SGD3 focus on health and well-being. What game changer do you want to play in Asia with e-health startup involved in AI preventive care and healthy longevity? Who has the most aging population in the world? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's that's actually a, a great, great question, right? And, and I'll, I'll take a step back and say the role of technology in uh, healthcare, right, is not for sure not limited in preventive care, right? Is is uh, is uh, embedded in uh, uh, in uh, uh, long in the remote uh, e diagnostic, right? Is uh, now embedded in uh, of uh, 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 drug development, right, is is in every phase of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, healthcare, right, and, and and also for sure now we have uh, you know uh, doctors using a hololens when they are performing procedures and operations, right. So so it's actually playing a key role in every aspect of uh, healthcare, right. And and I would say healthcare is one of the primary industries right that we are looking at in terms of applying more ai and digital technology right to improve the quality and and uh, and uh, uh, and the quality of care right uh, i would just call out that uh, at the, at the, the at the same time uh, i think there is there for sure needs to be a level of of cautiousness Right, uh, right. You, you, you know, when, when people are making uh, diagnostic, right? when people are, are, are applying technology, right? Uh, we we absolutely have to be cautious, right, and be mindful that, right. I mean, this is you know people's well-being and lives that we're talking about, right. So so just having that extra layer of uh, cautiousness is something that Microsoft pays a lot of attention to. Uh, but but again, right, uh, just, just we 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 want 
to drive technology in every aspect of uh, healthcare, right? Like just drugs, uh, preventive care for sure, and and uh, and uh, operations procedures, all right. So just every aspect that we we feel there is great potential. And again, you know, I know it sounds cliche, but uh, digitalization in healthcare is really just getting started, right? It's just getting started. Super, super. So thank you uh, so very much, Yang, for your fantastic insights in our discussion and in this Q and A. Uh, you know, Microsoft has been a very special company for me in my research journey. Somehow, they were willing to talk to me because, and, and that wasn't a given. I had just finished my PhD in 2005 and uh, began this journey around then over the past 15 years. Uh, it may have been something about the humility of the company to re realize at that point they needed to start talking to startups and when I showed interest in trying to understand how startups and big companies engage for some reason in different parts of the world over a period of time, uh, Microsoft was willing uh, to talk to me. In fact, at one point, somebody said, you know, now you have uh, been talking to us so much, uh, we might even want to pick your brain as a consultant. And I said, no, uh, I want to remain a neutral observer uh, and uh, be able to say what I frankly think about you guys. And of course, over time, we have continued to have a lot of cordial relations and I've been sharing my research findings, but still as a neutral observer. And I think I am so pleased that uh, it has been like that. And uh, now this latest chapter is this uh, interaction with uh, the current uh, CEO of the Greater China uh, region. Um, and so I really appreciate this. It has been a, a, a real a privilege to be have been able to follow this journey. To all of you in the room, thank you so much for coming. To those of you online, thank you for joining. And uh, I think there are some refreshments outside and there are some books uh, that you're uh, more than welcome uh, to uh, purchase and I'll be more than happy to sign. Um, also, I want to thank in particular Christina Mo. Uh, for making this executive forum possible and her team uh, for working so hard. And also, I'm so happy that my wife, Deepali, is here, who has been a great support. <laughs> All right. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for having so, 